You are listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts Andre Hagberdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome, listeners, to the SDSU podcast. I am your host, Andre Hagverdian. We'll be joined shortly by my co-host, Paul Garrison. We are finally here. We made it to game week, week zero of the college football season is this Saturday. And San Diego State plays in week zero this year against the Ohio Bobcats. It is a game that was scheduled earlier this year because of a scheduling issue with San Diego State's fourth non-conference opponent, New Mexico State, uh, have double booking itself because of a a move from independent to conference member. San Diego State had to scramble and find a new opponent. Ohio stepped up to the challenge to come to Snapdragon Stadium and play against the Aztecs on Saturday. Ohio is a very good team. They won 10 games last year. They played in the MAC championship. They beat Wyoming in the Arizona Bowl, so they uh, have a lot of returning starters on both sides of the ball, and that'll be a tough matchup. Uh, But before we get to previewing that game, we have an interview with Sean Cole, the newest San Diego State baseball head coach, who was named uh, the successor to Mark Martinez, who retired about a month ago. Coach Cole was the pitching coach at San Diego State for the last two years. And he now takes over as the head coach. I think you guys will enjoy the conversation Paul and I had with Coach Cole. Uh, afterwards, we'll come back, give you a few thoughts on our conversation with him before we get into the Ohio preview. We want to welcome the newest head coach of San Diego State Baseball, Sean Cole, to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Well, we're doing great. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, congratulations, obviously, on the new hire. You know, we, we right before we uh, hopped on uh, to record, we were talking about, you know, you how great of a reputation you have within the high school ranks. How do you feel when you hear that or where does that come from? Well, it makes me feel good. It does, because like we were talking about before we got on here, one of the things that Two things that were instilled in me a long time ago by Coach Lopez, who's obviously been one of my mentors um, through my through my career. And I got lucky to have such a great mentor. Um, but he always said, you know, treat people like gold. Treat them, you, you, you just never know. He actually used to say, you never know when you're entertaining angels. Mm-hmm. So treat treat everybody as well as you can, regardless if it's the person that's cleaning the locker room or the athletic director. Just treat people well. The other the other side of that is from a recruiting standpoint, one of the things that I tried to establish a long time ago, and this was the other thing that coach taught me is regardless of who it is, get back to everybody, um, even if it takes me two weeks. And I'll apologize for taking so long. But that was one of the things I got a call last week from a, a former um, baseball player here, an alum who's a coach at a I believe a D3 school in San Marcos. And he's a retired police officer also. But the first thing he said when I called him back is he goes, I'm surprised you called me back. I reach out to Division One coaches all the time and they don't ever get back to me. And I said that that was something that was instilled in me uh, when I was at Arizona is get back to everybody. And, and even if it's a text message response. And when I first got announced with this job, I got hit with a ton of text messages, which I appreciate the support, um, people, you know, excited. And some of them, it took me two weeks to get back to them. And and I still did. And um, it's just important. And maybe that's where the reputation comes from and just um, getting back to people, communicating with them. Even if, let's just say today, and I'll use Granite Hills as an an example, because James Davis is an alum and he's also become a friend of mine. Um, Let's just say today he doesn't have a player for us at San Diego State. And I call him. that's not to say he's not going to have somebody in three years or four years or five years. So just because today he doesn't have somebody doesn't mean that it's not a value for me to at least pick up the phone, call him, connect with them. Um, the other things that I try to do is not just call people about, Hey, what, what can you do for me? 
Like I'm calling and just, Hey, how's the family? How, how's your golf game? You hitting them straight? Are you, you know, talk about just normal stuff and be a normal human being and not always, what can you do for me? Um, so I try to be conscious of that. And maybe that's where the reputation has come from, or I don't know. Um, um, and, and the other thing too, since I got here as an assistant coach, I've made it a priority. And I've said this to a lot of the local coaches in the area is that it is very important for me to um, recruit and try to own our local players. Like our rosters should be a core group of San Diego. And, and you can, you can always creep up in the orange County and LA also it's Southern California, but the, the, the better players here in San Diego, we should at least be in the mix on all of them. Um, we're not going to get them all, but we get them or at least drive up the price for our competition, especially the ones that are out of state. You mentioned uh, you, you've been here as an assistant coach for the last couple of years. What brought you to San Diego State? Why did you want to come and be an assistant coach at San Diego State a couple of years ago? Good question. There's there's a few layers to that. I was obviously on the, the – I was in Kentucky, um, and I spent some time in North Carolina with Team USA also. My wife and I are both from the West Coast. Our parents are both on the West Coast. And we're in that season of life where our parents are getting to that age where we where time is is valuable. I'm helping my mom move actually in two weeks from Washington down to Arizona. And mm-hmm. if I'm on the other side of the country, those things are difficult to do. So that was first and foremost, one of the more attractive things uh, was getting getting back to the West Coast, getting close to family. And then also my time at U of A, I've recruited in San Diego a lot. And I always thought San Diego State from afar was a very appealing place to coach at, not only because of obvi- the obvious uh, reasons, you know, San Diego's paradise, the weather's awesome, uh, the beaches, baseball is at a high level on the West Coast. But I just, you know, San Diego State's always been appealing to me. And when Coach Martinez reached out to me about the job, one of the things he said to me is, you know, San Diego State's never been out of a regional. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't even... I did not know that. So to take on the challenge of coming here and and helping accomplish something that's never been done, uh, especially something like that in a in a storied program with a lot of players that have come through here, a lot of major leaguers, um, that's something that that is um, top of mind for me. That we we need to get that done. Uh, we need to get to a super regional. We need to get to Omaha. Um, there's been an influx of talent that's come through here that should be able to elevate this program to get to those, those heights in college baseball. So for me personally, that is a challenge of mine, especially now taking over as the head coach, I was fortunate enough to win a national championship as an assistant, and I would love to to do it as a head coach. And then you guys know my connection to the Padres too. I worked here for a few years and that, that was another aspect of it that I thought would be pretty cool is because of that relationship and that dynamic and some of the things that I'm going to continue to try to push to grow uh, with that relationship um, appealed to me also. With Coach Martinez's, you know, retirement, how quickly did, you know, things move with J.D. Wicker to make you the next head coach? Well, well, you guys, you saw the timeline. And and that was one of the things I, I touched on in my press conference that uh, the reason why it, it moved um, the way that it did is when I was contacted about the pitching job, uh, Mark and administration had talked to me about my interest in being a head coach and waiting or, or eventually taking over the program. So um, it, it moved pretty quick. And I think some of that has to do with obvious things like the portal, current roster. Um, yeah. You know, we're in that space now where you you can't you can't wait for too long. Otherwise, players are going to get antsy and they're going to start looking elsewhere. But J.D. Wicker, he, he, he seems to like to hire from within. Um, mm-hmm. What? What advantages do you have moving from an assistant to the head coach? You mean because of the promotion from within? Yeah. Obviously connection with the players. So, and that, and that's the thing that I've always said on the college side versus the pro side, continuity with your college coaching staff is extremely important for the culture and the players that you're developing because it's, it's a much smaller group. It's, it's, you know, three to five coaches and, and, now they've expanded the rosters to 40, but not only are you developing young men to become better baseball players, but you're developing, excuse me, and growing them 
to become young men and grow into to men with families and and um, go into other other potential job avenues and just um, when you have that continuity and that trust and that connection, it, it allows you to seamlessly continue to move forward in those areas of development. So I think that's huge. You know, next Friday we have our first team meeting for the fall, and for for our players and some of our staff members that are still here, I, I think there's extreme value in seeing a familiar face especially with our pitching staff. Yeah, 100%. And I, I think um, generally speaking with with what baseball is in San Diego, there's a feeling uh, so in some some regards that San Diego State has underachieved. So what, what is your assessment of, you know, the past five years or so and where they've mm-hmm. been as, as you, because they've had a lot of, you know, a lot of major leaguers. Have, mm-hmm. have come through and are in the minor league system and are drafted and picked up every year. Um, but at the same time, you know, last year was, I think, with the first time that they've won the Mountain West, which isn't always known for its baseball um, in a number of years. And so just what is your general assessment of, you know, where the program has been, maybe even before mm-hmm. you got here and, you know, that that look from a view uh, from afar that you were talking about up in Arizona? I always hate trying to speak on on circumstances or situations when I don't know the inner workings. I, you never know. From year to year, there could have been injuries. The draft could have taken some guys that they were banking on to push them to the next level. So I, I don't want to speak on that too much. I will speak on most recently, like last year. We won the conference, and and I felt like we underachieved. And I, I think Coach Martinez would probably feel the same way, and so so would our other coaches. I think. It, there was a period of time during the season where it was in our hands to win the conference outright, and we just didn't get it done. And I also felt like rolling into the conference tournament, we had a little momentum to to do perform better in the conference tournament and push ourselves into a regional. And I definitely think we had the talent. Uh, we just had we we had some. We just we just didn't get it done. I don't I don't I. The other thing for me, and our and our guys are going to hear it next week is I don't want to spend too much time on the past. I want to talk about things moving forward. At the end of the day, we walked away with the conference championship. So let's build off that. And, you know, my first year here, the year before was, was not a good season. Maybe one of the worst in San Diego state history and definitely the worst that I've experienced as a college coach. So in some, in some ways to keep it a positive, we still improved from that previous year. And we put ourselves in a position, which is what you always want at the end of the year, is you want to be in a position to win the conference. You want to be in a position to to go to the conference tournament and compete to get into a regional. And we did accomplish that. We came up short, though. So uh, I could assure you my standards and expectations are we have to be way better than that. We have to be way better. And there's some things that um, we're going to need to improve upon in order to to control our destiny a little bit more at the end of the season. But I'll say this with team USA university of Arizona, the year we won a national championship, um, we weren't ranked in the top 25. We weren't picked to win the conference Uh, team USA. When we went and played Japan and in the world cup in Japan, Japan was number one. Nobody expected us to beat them. So going back to what I just said at the end of the season, all anybody remembers is how you finish. So if you're in a position to get yourself into a regional then then that should be a positive and we were in a position to do that last year and we just we we came up short and i don't want to take anything away from our competition either um air force was really good and they 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 beat us and knocked us out so i i'm going to stay on the positive side that we were moving in the right direction and now it's my job and the staff and the players to continue to move that forward this year you know as a new head coach you're obviously going to set a lot of short-term, long-term goals for 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 the program, and to reach those goals, you need the res- your resources, right? Do you presently mm-hmm. believe that you have resources at San Diego State to be able to reach those goals? I do, and I, I'll talk further beyond just resources, support from people mm-hmm. within within the athletic department, and I and 100, I feel that um, that definitely factored into some of our conversations resources I believe are going to get better uh, and that's one of the things we talked about it, it, it's my job to ensure that our product on the field is going in the right direction and improving and if we have support uh, from administration which I believe we do and then the resources 
And if those things are going working in unison and that momentum keeps moving forward, um, the sky's the limit. So, uh, you know, if you look at LSU this year, they won a national championship. They had an army of, of people supporting that. Um, and, and I do believe, I think you, you guys touched on it a little, little while ago. I do believe this, and the Padres have showed that even though they're having a challenging season, there's a lot of people in San Diego that want to support baseball. I do believe we have we have support. Uh, resources are going to continue and improve. And and with the align, alignment of what I'm trying to do on the field and with the coaching staff, I think we're going to be in a very good place for the next number of years. What and what can you do to get more people, more alumni, more fans to come out to Tony Gwynn Stadium to watch games? Win. Hmm. <laughs> Those things go hand in hand. I, I you know, like people want to come out if they're going to spend time on a Friday night or a Saturday, they want to come out and see a good baseball game. And I think the pitch clock has been a huge aspect of that too. Like you get a two and a half hour game, you know, some, sometimes people are at home by, by nine or nine 30. And that's, that's good. I'm a huge advocate for the pitch clock and in, in quick games, but yeah, we gotta, we gotta win at a higher level. You know, if, if you win, people want to be a part of that. They want to come out and see it. If you create a good atmosphere, people want to be a part of that. Yeah. Um, if you bring in good competition and non-conference, people want to see that. So, you know, scheduling is another aspect of that in the Tony Gwynn Classic. Like us um, continuing to ele- elevate that, I think, creates more buzz, too. So um, but at the end of the day, and 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 I'm probably hard headed to a fault on this, but win, win more. And you and, and people come around, they want to be around it more and, and you get you get more cool stuff, too, because people want to be be involved and they want to be connected to winning. Um, another group, obviously, I mean, anytime a, a new coach comes into it, um, there's there's a huge legacy of SDSU baseball, um, mm-hmm. huge legacy. How how do you or what has been maybe your conversation with, you know, baseball alum, um, whether it's big leaguers or just people who have been connected to the game? You've already mentioned some of the coaches that, that you're talking to at the local high school colleges. But I mean, what has that conversation been like with some of those alumni and, you know, you selling your vision to them um, and maybe their involvement in it. It's been positive. People have been excited. I'm, I'm fortunate. My, my first year with the Padres, Bud Black was the manager and we're both from the Northwest. We both played in the NWAC in junior college. So we have a connection there. We also have some mutual friends. So Bud and I are going to connect in the off season. I'm actually going to go to the Padres Rockies uh, one of their games. I think that's coming up in a few weeks and I'm going to try to say hello to Alan Treo and, and Bud and Travis Lee. And I had a two hour conversation about two weeks ago and we have some connections too. We both grew up in the same neck of the woods up in Washington. And I know his dad well, and I know his brother Tabor uh, and, and he's excited to come out and be around the program more. Uh, Steven Strasburg um, has been a much, he's been around the program more in the last couple of weeks, which is a, also another good sign. I mean, just to have a guy like that come around our players is huge uh, and have his support is huge. Uh, Chris Gwynn and I and, and Anthony Gwynn, we talked a few weeks ago. I had a three hour lunch with Chris in Temecula about a week ago. You know, it's, it's, it's a two way street. Alumni wanting to be involved. Awesome. But I also have to do my part connecting with them and getting them more engaged with the program. And sometimes that's tough to do. People live in other states. They have other they have families. They have their jobs. So we need to do a better job on our end of having those touch points through the year of just updating, uh, updating them where the program is, where it's going. Um, I have some ideas. I'll give you an example. One of the ideas we may do this fall is I'm going to put a bunch of alumni names in a hat. And one of our guys has to pick that player's name. And regardless of what year they were here, they got they have to go research them. They have to come back and present to the team about them. Um, yeah. We may, be, may we may even do a short fifteen minute Zoom call with that alumni um, to have that connection. Um, we need to do a better job of you know sending a newsletter or getting them on a group chat and just sending maybe a two minute interview or a minute interview with Irv Weems after practice one day. And this is what's going on, like. Those connections have to be provided by by myself and, and my staff in order to continue to grow uh, the alumni base in the connection and making them also feel like, and I'm not saying this wasn't going on before, I'm speaking about right now, but making them feel like they 
they, they're a part of something. I think that's key. I think that's what every alum wants. The number one thing that I've heard over and over is they really enjoyed the the golf golf weekend. So we got to get that rolling again. And I'm going to have to dust off my golf clubs. And um, <laughs> but, you know, that's something that they all enjoyed. So so we need to get that going again. And I and and I think that the reason why that fell by the wayside in the last number of years was just, you know, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. messed up a lot of stuff so 100%. you know and so we got to get that going again and whether that'll happen this year or next year I, I haven't fully decided yet because the number one priority for me right now is our current team like we got to you know we need to we need to make sure we have a, a good fall and we're heading in a good direction into the spring um, but the alumni is definitely top of mind for me because of the storied history and the connection and then having a lot of alum that live here locally too um, one of the things James Davis and I have talked about is maybe there's a um, a breakfast that I do with the local alum that are high school coaches and just alum that are in the area. And maybe we do that once a month or once every two months. I don't know. And, and I'm all in, if I, especially if I can get a free breakfast out of those guys. hundred <laughs> percent. Um, you know, when you, I guess, like think about, um, you know, a Sean Cole led team, mm-hmm. what reputation do you want your Aztecs to have? One, and I think that it's been established since I've been here in the last two years, is that our opponents are going to, they're going to know that our pitching staff is going to come at them. Um, We're going to attack them with fastballs. We're going to throw strikes. uh, We're going to compete at a high level there. Uh, Overall, as a team, what I want, what I want people to say when they leave, regardless if they win or, or lose, is they, they, they do it right. Um, They're professional about what they do. Um, they play the game hard. Um, they're on and off the field the right way. They, they handle, uh, umpires are going to make bad calls. People got to understand that. So just because you get a bad call, do you have to show bad body language and show up the umpire every time? No, like handle it professionally. Like the things that I've learned in my past is the, the age group that you're coaching and leading lead them to to the, or coach them to the level that, that they want to get to. So I'm going to, I'm going to, these guys are college athletes, but I'm going to ask them to do things at a professional man. I want, you know, like, yeah, another thing for me, and you could say that, well, coach, you're, you're OCD about these things. Like we're going to have a clean dugout. It, it bothers me that there's bags laying everywhere and, and sandwich wrappers. And those are little details that, that are big. Like you're, we're going to have a clean dugout. We're going to handle ourselves the right way on the field. We're not going to show people up. We're not going to show bad body language and we're going to play the game hard. And we're going to know the finer points of the game, like base running, playing catch on defense, putting the ball in play on offense, throwing strikes on the mound, like do basic things better than everybody else. And, and those things are going to start in, in our fall practices, but overall, operate as a professional on and off the field. And I know there are, there's always going to be some, some speed bumps through the course of a season. Young people make poor decisions at times and, and you got to handle those situations individually and grow those people to learn from their mistakes. So, but at, at the highest level, I want people to walk away and say, man, they play hard and they do it the right way. What originally led you to, into coaching? So my bachelor's degree, I, I was study or I studied kinesiology. I wanted to go more on the side of strength and conditioning and, and biomechanics and, and work with athletes that way. And when I got done playing in college, my junior college coach called me and asked me, uh, hey, do you, do you wanna you wanna make some money this summer and be a pitching coach for a, a summer travel team? you know, I'm fresh out of college. I don't have a job. Of course I'm going to do that. So I tell people all the time, like coaching grabbed onto me and, and kind of kept pulling me. Like I, I got it. I, so I started coaching that summer travel team. And then I was going to grad school at the university of Washington. And I got an internship in the front office with the Mariners. Um, and then from there that turned into a junior college pitching job. And in my first year in junior college, we won a championship. So I was like, well, this college coaching thing is easy, which is a joke. It's very challenging. But at the time, at a young age, I was like, well, I'm going to keep pursuing college. When I was going to grad school, I had to get another internship to finish out my my uh, master's degree. So I wrote letters to three professional teams and then three Division One schools, Stanford, Cal, Arizona, 
And then the Angels, Red Sox, and I can't remember the other professional team, but Tony Regan's the GM of the Angels at the time reached out to me. And then Andy Lopez reached out to me at Arizona. And I, because of coming off of that junior college season, I decided to stay in college and go that route at Arizona. And I had no, no intention of landing a job at Arizona. My whole thing was go down there, work my tail off, learn as much as I can, parlay that into a, a pitching job in the Cape Cod League, which I did. I had a job lined up with um, Yarmouth Dennis to go do that. And then I was hoping from there to get a volunteer job at probably a mid-major. And I, I right place, right time. Coach Lopez wanted to get away from the pitching and he offered me the pitching job. And it was funny because he offered it to me one day and he told me what it paid and all those things. And I was a young single guy getting out of grad school and I was like, I'm in. And he goes, no, 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 no. Go home. Think about it. You know? And I'm like, there's nothing to think about. This is university of Arizona. Andy Lopez, you're a legend. Mark Wazikowski, the head coach of Oregon, was the recruiting coordinator. Like, no better place for me to be to learn how to become a college coach. And I couldn't have got any luckier. So um, I definitely pursued some of it, but I, coaching just kind of kept pulling at me. You know, you mentioned earlier that you had worked for the Padres doing some player development. At your introductory press conference, you talked about how that helped your coaching career you also uh -huh. mentioned uh, how you had some ideas about collaborating with the Padres that you know you were kind of thinking about is that something things you can share um things that um have developed since since the press conference yeah I, I'll give you an example um last year we played the Padres instructs team last fall and we were going to do that this fall and, and their schedule got adjusted so we're not doing that we may I'm waiting for confirmation on this. I think we we may be playing a game against USD in November uh, over at Petco. So, you know, things like that. And then also just ideas that I have to elevate uh, the Tony Gwynn Legacy Classic and, and be able to somehow partner with that just because Tony was such an icon with the Padres and San Diego State. So, um, you know, those are things that I'm going to continue to try to try to grow and talk about with the Padres. AJ, AJ Preller hired me with the Padres. So to be able to have that connection with him and then some of the assistant GMs and other people that are within that organization, you know, it helps to get some of those ideas firing and, and things that we're kicking around. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to work in player development and scouting. So I was a part of the draft. Uh, I did all the um, pre-draft workouts throughout the country. I did international stuff um, on, on the player development and draft side. And then um, I worked in player development. I managed in the minor leagues. I was a coordinator in the minor leagues. So I, I've always say it like this, and it's the same for players, players and coaches on the professional side. The amount of reps you can get in a year is like dog years compared to college because you're out there for early work, you have games, and you're playing almost every day, uh, almost year round. So um, for me to, to learn on the pro side and get as many reps and see as many reps and then also see, you know, the best players in the world. It just gives you a totally different lens to look through um, versus, you know, just being on the college side. So looking at uh, the posted job position for the assistant coach baseball role, it's online um, yeah. emphasis in hitting. Um, what is it that you're looking for? In, in that yeah. assistant that you're that you're you know excited to bring in and add to your staff my choice to stay with the pitching you know means that i i have to get get some qualified guys around me to entrust uh the offense and the position players with and i'm still going to be involved i'm going to be around them every day i'm going to watch and observe and then we're going to have daily staff meetings about things that we should do moving forward but i've always believed this in college had a period of time and there's still a little bit of this going on where they, there's on certain coaching staffs, there are guys that just strictly recruit. I think that you need to have a healthy balance of guys that have backgrounds in player development and recruiting. And if you have that and you have three or four coaches that have, have those, those abilities, um, it creates more balance across the board with your coaching staff. So um, you can have a, a better rotation of three or four coaches that are able to go out and recruit uh, that you can trust to go do that. And going back to what I said earlier about doing a better job um, with our local 
uh, talent, if you have three or four coaches that are rotating around, that that creates a pretty good presence for you. So I'm looking, I'm looking for guys that have balance, whether it's on the pro side or college side. Um, the recruiting coordinator role, I can I can live with if it's um, a little bit less balance. Like if it's somebody that may have more of a scouting or recruiting background, but I still want that individual to be involved with our team and our day to day practice and player development because I think that that's healthy from a culture standpoint and just being connected with our players. Um, but yeah, I'm looking for guys that have, have balance in those areas. So, uh, and, and I, I think we're pretty close to, to accomplishing that. Um, you've already mentioned Irvin Williams who, you know, had some injuries last year and still I think was an incredibly exciting player. Yeah. Um, you know, Sean uh, Montoya is just coming out of from nowhere and and just raking and and you know really exciting player. Um, but but who are some of those players that that you know fans should be excited about that are coming back um, for next season? Well, I don't know if you guys saw Xavier Cardenas on the mound last year, but he was up to ninety eight a few times, yeah. and I've probably applied way too much pressure to myself with with Xavier. But I told him, hey, if you're not a top five pick at, at the end of your time. And I'm not talking about rounds. I'm talking about top five overall. Uh, mm. Then, then you and I have failed. So right. I think he's going to be exciting to watch this year and could continue to see him grow um, on the mound. Uh, you know, Xavier Gonzalez at shortstop. He's a really good shortstop, but we need more from him. And I'm going to tell him that again next week. Like, you need to be more of a assertive leader. You're now older. Um, you've been through the Division One. Uh, cycle for one year and it's time for you to take more of a leadership presence on the field as a key uh, player as a shortstop. Um, I'm excited to see David Whittle and his progression and how he's going to grow taking over Pancho Ruiz's uh, role behind behind the dish as a catcher for us. Um, we have some exciting freshmen coming in also. Finley Bates is a guy that I'm I'm pretty excited about. I'm, I'm eager to see him. Drew Rudder uh, left-handed hitting outfielder. I'm excited to see him get going. Josh Casada, a kid that we recruited from Florida through some uh, pro connections that I have. Left-handed hitting second baseman. I'm 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 excited to see him. I mean, we we have a whole list of guys that I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to see how some of these guys progressed in summer ball. But yeah, Irv, I've already had some some serious conversations with him about how he's got a he's in the leadership role too. All those guys up the middle, David Whittle. Gonzalez, Irv Weems, you guys need to lead this group to the next level. And you, and you know, he's got, we got some big shoes to fill with Cole Carrick being gone. So offensively in that three, four, five position, some of these guys got to, they got to grow up. They got to step up and they got to drive runners in, but I'm excited about the group. We have some transfers that came in. Also, we have a guy named um, Jacob Reardon who uh, is coming in from um, Arkansas Pine Bluff. He's a Georgia kid. 95 to 97 this year in the Cape. Um, I'm excited to see him. We have a junior college transfer coming in, Dylan Hawks, left-handed pitcher, who was up to 95 this summer. I, I'm excited at with all the pieces we have. Trevor Fox is another guy. I mean, he's a large human being out there. I'm 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 excited to see him be a big target over at first base and 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 the power that he shows in BP translates. Same with uh, Drew Giannini. I mean, I can go on and on with our guys. I'm excited about our our whole team. You know, you were hired right, you know, as the transfer portal was ending. You know, mm -hmm. how does the portal work for players when a new coach is hired for, for a team? It really depends on how your roster shakes out, because in some cases, and you're seeing it at certain schools like Northwestern right now. I mean, I think they have 15 players left because there was a mass exodus. Uh, thankfully, uh, people love San Diego so much that we didn't have a bunch of guys jump in the portal. And that goes back to your earlier question too, about the continuity of promoting within is, you know, our guys were already comfortable with me and they, they, they know me. So guys weren't eager to jump in the portal on the other side of it, you know, in the timing, we were pretty much done just because of our roster numbers. Um, but in some circumstances, when a coach takes over and he sees some areas of need, you can jump in the portal. I mean, it's 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 like free agency. So, and that's something that we're probably going to take a hard look at with with our current group and heading into the next summer. Are there major areas of need that we need to supplement out of the portal, possibly? 
you know, under Coach Martinez, a lot of Aztecs played in the Alaska Baseball League. Mm-hmm. You know, that ended in early August. Are there any updates on any other summer leagues that your players played in? There was a bulk of guys that uh, we sent to Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, there, there's the Marshals and the Bucks and Chad Shepard, who runs that organization I've known for a long time, and they've elevated it in major ways to to try to make it one of the more premier uh, West Coast collegiate leagues. Like he had guys from LSU and Alabama and Texas this year that were out there playing this summer. And we had a core group of our sophomores um, that went out there to to grow uh, playing wise. But the other reason why we sent them there is because they have a strength and conditioning staff and they have a gym that they can access at all times. They also do biomechanics assessments. And those those are all key areas to continue player development. Like the, what has changed with summer baseball is it's not just send guys out now to get more reps and play more games. There are other areas that they can continue to um, to grow and, and, and develop. And in Salt Lake, they offer a lot of those things. And then we had a core group that actually stayed here and lifted five days a week with our strength and conditioning coach and played in a local San Diego uh, summer league. And I look at that more of like like um, instructional league where they can they can get their lifting in and then they can go work on a couple key key areas that we want them to improve on and and kind of do it in a um, low stress environment. What's the uh, name of the local league they played in? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> Shoot. I don't remember off the top of my head right now. No, you will get it. Um, you know, as you are coming into this role, um, obviously not in a negative sense, um, comparing yourself to Coach Martinez, but you're different people. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. what, what might be, you know, you, you mentioned the clean dugout, you know, I mean, what, what might be some of those differences between, you know, what Mark did and, and, and how you're kind of seeing your mark, <laughs> no pun intended, um, yeah. of, of, your, you know, your mark on the program. Uh, you know, obviously personalities are a little bit different and that, and that's, that's, that's a normal thing for when you look at a coaching staff. Uh, I don't know if there's a lot that I'm looking to the change that Mark did, I think if anything, um, we're just going to carry it forward. So, you know, m- my personality and, and the way I connect with the players might be different, but I, you know, we'll look up time. will tell if that's a good thing or a bad thing for me. And I think that was one of the other appealing things is, is like being a part of the program in the last two years and, and seeing how Mark did it and, and looking at where our group is right now, I don't, I don't think that there's a lot that has to be overhauled in order to get us moving in the right direction. And sometimes you see this all the time in, in certain cases where just a new voice can push teams to a whole nother level. Um, and sometimes that's just because it's just there. You can tell young student athletes the same thing over and over. And then somebody else comes in and says it in a different way. And all of a sudden it clicks with them. And, and you're like, you're standing there and I'm like, I told you that five times, but maybe, you know, maybe it's just, it'll be a different because the coaching staff is going to change too. So it's just all those dynamics. And then going back to alumni and their excitement. And, and I don't think this is anything with Mark or their current state of the program. It's just, it's just kind of how things work sometimes when there's change, people get excited about that. So, and I don't think that that's necessarily coming from a negative. So if anything, I think it's a positive, like I was saying, is like, I don't I don't think we're going to have to necessarily overhaul and, and sit here. And I'm not going into this saying, well, I got to blow up everything that Coach Martinez did. No, if anything, carry it forward with some some small tweaks. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, what, I think one of the things we've had an opportunity to, to talk with, you know, softball head coach, uh, soccer, men's soccer head coach. Um, in addition, obviously, to, to talking with, you know, um, football, et cetera. Um, and and the, the one common theme amongst all of them is how unique San Diego State is as a program because there is an isolation. Everybody's not in their own little silo, just, just leading their own teams, mm-hmm. but that they really appreciate the camaraderie, being able to bounce ideas off of um, the other head coaches, assistant coaches, et cetera. Um, have you had the opportunity, you know, to to kind of get some advice, maybe specifically from Coach Hoke or co- from Coach Dutcher, or just what has that interaction been for you as you've taken the reins? 
Unfortunately, since this transition ha has happened, um, both of those coaches are really busy right now. Yes, they are. <laughs> so, but we do, I, I do have a plan. Um, I was actually talking with, and cause I know Matt Soria really well with basketball and, and, and also I love football and basketball. So Matt, we're going to, at some point, I'm going to get over there and just, I want to see what they do. I mean, they've had a lot of success. I did this when I was at Arizona and it took me a little while to realize like, man, you got a lot of great coaches around you in other sports. You should be picking their brain on why they're having success, but I haven't had a chance to really get over and talk to either one of those coaches. I have had the chance to um, bounce some ideas off of some of our other head coaches right now that are hanging around my office because um, their offices are right out here. But those are more of like, hey, um, you know, how are you balancing the budget? You know, like yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get the, the ins and outs from them because they've been here for a long time, whether it's a tennis coach, men's tennis or lacrosse coach or men's soccer coach. Like I'm definitely going to be, and we have a head coaches meeting next week um, where I'm going to be in the room and I, I might just throw it out like, Hey, I would love to sit down with any of you. Um, the last two or three weeks for me, like I've been saying to my wife, have kind of been in the eye of the storm. And there's some things that I've wanted to make sure, whether that's coaching staff or some of the recruits that we're recruiting right now, and then our current roster, it's very important to me that those those things are in a good place before we get going um, so that there's good momentum for the program heading into the fall. And I've prioritized those things. Um, I think when the dust settles a little bit, as we get into the routine and rhythm of the fall, I'm going to be able to hit up some of these other coaches and and ask them if they can grab some coffee or if we can sit in on, on their practices. I'm definitely going to do that. Like I said, it took me it took me a few years as a young coach at U of A to realize what I had around me. And I need to take advantage of that because I'm always reading books from other sports or what Navy SEALs are doing. Or, you know, if you can take one thing away from what other teams or or businesses or CEOs that have had success and apply it to what we're doing, why would you not do that? And it's the same thing with the coaches that I'm crossing paths with every every day in the same hallways. Coach, last set of questions, but these are quick, fun ones so that our listeners can get to know you a little bit better as a person. Uh -oh. uh, what is your favorite food? Man, I like food. So I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can give you a long list. Um, I'm never going to turn down a good steak. I love sushi, uh, Italian food. My wife's Filipino, so... Um, there's obviously a lot of Filipino food that I like, and I'm also one of my kryptonites is double stuff Oreos. Yeah, nice. a complete answer right there. Yeah. <laughs> what a favorite movie or TV show? Well, you guys might laugh at me for this, but I do record PTI every day on ESPN. I love, I, I love that show. Um, that's usually what I watch before I go to bed, either that or Seinfeld trying to think of a recent show. I, uh, I loved House of Cards. Entourage was one of my favorites. Uh, Yellowstone. I can't wait till that comes back out. And I think that's coming out in November. My wife and I love Yellowstone. Uh, I started watching Billions a couple of days ago, but I just, I haven't had a bunch of time to really sit down in the last couple of weeks to, to dig into a show. Favorite movie. I got a lot of them. Probably one of my favorites, and my wife gets mad at me every time because it's it's on like every other day, and I can Wedding Crashers. I love Wedding yeah. Crashers. I love old school. <laughs> you know, I, I can watch I can I can watch those movies all the time. Yeah, those are some of my favorites too. What about music? What who's your favorite musical artist or group? I'm all over the map with music. Every morning I have a routine. We have a Sonos system in the house, and and. I'm a big jazz fan, so it may be Miles Davis, uh, but it, that could flip to, I think this morning I turned on um, Bob Marley. Um, it just depends on 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 the uh, mood. Usually in the morning, Jack Johnson, but I can go from that to I can listen to Drake. I'm still an old school West Coast hip hop guy, Snoop, Dr. Dre, but I also can I can venture over to Tom Petty and Eric Clapton and. I'm I'm all over the map when it comes to music. I love music. I think if it if I had a choice to to have a TV or music, I'm probably gonna 
I'm going to lean toward music. Fun fact, uh, Miles Davis's Kind of Blue album came out to, today in 1959. Man, and that is a great album. Yeah. Stan Getz, do you know who that is? Yeah, of course. Oh, man. I just, I, I love jazz. Wynton Marsalis. We actually saw uh, Wynton. He was here, I think, last year in the um, the show. Mm. That was awesome. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I love music. I can, I can go all over Nirvana. I grew up in the Northwest Pearl jam, stone temple pilots. I can, I can go on for days with music. I, have I you think, ever heard I of this is a future podcast. I'll have to, I'll have to click off. Cause I, I, I cannot, <laughs> I that's out of my depth between the two of you, but you guys should. Yeah, definitely. I was going to say, have you ever heard of Terrace Martin? Yep. Yep. He's one of my favorites. He's a guy from Compton, but he does a lot of jazz R and B stuff. Yep. Every Christmas around Christmas time, whether if we're traveling or or we're somewhere locally, we're always looking for like a Christmas jazz concert. So we've done, there's been some Charlie Brown Christmas jazz concerts. We've been to the uh, Rockets in New York at um, uh, Radio City Music Hall. Like I'm all in, 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 in going like the Nutcracker. It's got, like I would go every year in Seattle if I could. And my wife has to tell me, no, we got to take a break. I, I just... I, I love music. I love, yeah. and especially around the holidays, you know, anything that's Christmas, I'm all in. Nice. That's Last another one I'll add in too. Christmas Vacation, National Lampoons. Yeah. Every year I'm watching it. Now we, we ask this same kind of question, you know, usually it's like a, a, a new recruit or something like that. Um, and your answers are way better than these kids. Just, just <laughs> Well, I, I got a few years on them where I've been able to dabble in, yeah, in some yeah. things. So, <laughs> last one, uh, favorite hobby. Obviously, when you're not coaching baseball, what do you like to do mm -hmm. for fun? I love golf, but that's a love hate relationship. Um, I like shooting guns. I, I I I gunsmith a little bit too. I grew up in a military family. I have a huge Siberian Husky, and this may sound lame, but I I don't mind just going on a morning walk with him. I also have a fish tank. I've had fish tanks for a long time. I have a tank at home that um, I have some fish that are very delicate. So you got to stay water parameters and all those things. Um, that's another hobby of mine. I love reading books and I love traveling. Awesome. Coach, thank you for your time. Uh, congratulations again. We look forward to seeing, uh, you know, how, how the team does in your first year as head coach. I look forward to it too. And, and thank you for the time and the support. Paul, that was our interview with Sean Cole, the newest head coach. Seems like uh, just yesterday we had the prior head coach, Mark Martinez, on. I think that was uh, maybe about two months ago. And uh, now we've got the newest head coach on in the same offseason. What, what were your takeaways from talking to Coach Cole? I think I was surprised by how personable he was. Um, I, I know surprise is the right word, but you know, he just I thought he did a great job in everything that he said and how he said it and how approachable he was with with the, you know, just being able to give like good, open, honest answers um about where he sees the program at. And then overall, I, I think it's really smart of San Diego State, you know, the, the reality of where their baseball program is at is it's not at the level to have like the biggest budget. And I think that you have to have your head coach be elite as a position coach. Um, I think that's the smartest way to be able to kind of get the most bang for your buck, so to speak, as opposed to having like a, you know, a regular manager and then you have an assistant who's over hitting and an assistant who's over pitching. I think it makes a lot of sense to be able to get a guy like um, Coach Cole, an elite pitching coach, and just be great there and try to build around pitching and defense and then allow him to, you know, figure out how to do all of the other pieces as well. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense because, you know, you start looking through even just a small track record at San Diego state, somebody's going to come and get him. Someone is going to come in and offer him a bigger job. Um, someone's going to offer him more, more money, I should say. And, and so I think it's a, it's a great hire. And um, from what he said, it sounded like he was, it was, um, 
the plan since he got in Iowa, since he first was brought in. Yeah, I mean, San Diego State seems to really embrace the head coach and waiting philosophy. You know, mm-hmm. obviously, we know about Coach Dutcher. We know, you know, when Brady Hoke came back as a defensive line coach, I mean, I don't know if they expected Rocky Long to semi retire um, after the 2019 season, but I think that was the, the plan as well. Yeah. We know about the softball coach, and now we know about this. I think having the opportunity to talk to both coaches in such a short period of time in this open, you know, free form podcast and uh, environment. And this isn't meant to be a knock on coach Martinez, but I think if you listen to them back to back, you'll, you'll notice the the communication style, the, the personality, the uh, maybe more of a passion come out a lot more with coach Cole than coach Martinez. And that could be among, it could be a myriad of things, but I think, you know, when you're going into high school athletes living rooms or phone on the phone and talking to parents, I think connecting with them when you're trying to recruit them, you know, I, I can see Coach Cole being a little bit um, more successful in that avenue and connecting with these players a lot more. And I think uh, you're right. I think he just came the, his personality shown came across. Uh, he was very. Um, personable in, t- in his uh, answers and and I think that's going to resonate with not just the current players but you know the on, on the recruiting stage as well I agree and I, I also enjoyed and thought you know he t- he struck the right balance between not wanting to talk about the past in a negative light um, but also communicating that that's not acceptable where they were mm-hmm. and so I thought he took the right tone with that wanting to keep it positive and 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 sometimes I think that's always a challenge with especially with a school like San Diego State, where I think the potential is is obvious to a lot of people. And there's always a difference between, you know, wanting the program to be something that it's not, and then also accepting it for what it is and the steps that were made. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see because I think that this team that's coming up next year, you know, um, he he mentioned the pieces that that are exciting. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but man, they lost a lot, and in in some ways they they kind of mirrored the Padres this year in that, you know, they had these guys who, um, you know, Cole Carroll, Poncho Ruiz, T.J. Fontaine, all guys who are in major league, then um, you know, in the minors, and they didn't quite produce. You know, they they were good. They they did some good things, but they really depended on them to be great and you know for the most part that just wasn't the case and so the team you know be interesting is they're starting their um first fall meetings on friday you know bringing in that assistant that hitting coach and then seeing what they can do on that side of the plate because you know it it, you can only do so much with the pitching you can only make it be as dominant as it is but if you can't piece together runs consistently especially in a mountain West where so many of those games um, are played at elevation and, you know, it just kind of gives that advantage to the hitters. So it'll be interesting to see what he does going forward. But I think as far as, you know, first introduction, you know, I, I think Aztec fans should be very excited. I like what he talked about trying to build kind of the, the base, right. Uh, with the alumni, with the local San Diegans doing that exhibition game and at Petco in November against USD. But, you know, flat out, he said, you know, it's really going to come down to winning. You know, people want to see a winner. He knows that that's what's ultimately going to get the job done in terms of building that base. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the recruiting does. I mean, they just got a recent uh, Tory Pines uh, high school recruit, uh, Chase Klemke. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tory Pines infielder who's supposed to be a premier hitter. So it's a local guy staying home. And, you know, one the other guy, I think what it really stood out to me was when he's talking about Javier, Javier Xavier Cardenas mm-hmm. throwing 98 and how his ceiling is to be a top five pick in the draft. Which is wild. I mean, I've, I've yeah. honestly, I've honestly have, you know, when they were talking about Troy Melton, uh, Martinez was when, you know, in 2020, 2021, it was always like, you know, we're not really going to see the, the, he's so, he's so new 
to pitching. We're yeah. not really going to see the best that he has to offer. Um, and it was almost like he was he was keeping dampening the expectations because it's so hard to live up to that. Um, and so it was it was refreshing just to see a coach go the opposite direction. He said it, you know, maybe I'm putting too much pressure on him. But um, Xavier Cardenas was a huge big time recruit, um, top 150 in the nation, one of the top um, players in California um, and all of those things coming out of high school. And I, and I think that's another it's always an interesting thing about recruiting and and especially with local guys, especially with local guys. There's a lot of local guys who pick San Diego State, but then they get drafted. Mm-hmm. And it's it's almost like they give this nod to the local program because they want baseball in San Diego to go go. But you know, Adrian Gonzalez, as much as he committed to play for Tony Gwynn at that, you know, he he was not he was not going there. You know what I mean? And I think that um that that's what and I'm always interested in that is how they how they tow that line between, you know, being draft eligible, going into the minor leagues. And how much of those guys actually, you know, end up showing up on campus. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about that I thought was really good uh, was just the excitement from the alumni that has already started to to take hold. Um, and you know, I think I think again, he I think he he Coach Cole spoke really well about this. Um, it was something that over the last few years has kind of fallen off. I think I remember Coach Martinez saying there's a few things that, that I've let go of that I need to reclaim, you know, if he was going to not retire and he was going to come back for this next year. And I can very easily see one of those things being this and that that alumni connection. Um, but I thought Coach Cole said it well that, you know, so much changed because of COVID. Yeah, it's very it's very easy to forget and and just be like, well, he should always have a connection with the alumni and Strasburg should always be somebody that he's talking to. And well, who did you talk to during COVID? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like that's a that's a lot easier said than done when you're trying to just get a season in, um, and you can't be in person, and you're Zoom calling about everything, and nobody wants to do a Zoom call because it's like I've just done seven thousand of them this week, and so I really think that this year is kind of a perfect year to to kind of reestablish all of that. And the opportunity to do that with the excitement of a new coach, um, you know, a friend of mine uh, happened to be an assistant under um, Jim Dietz. And, you know, Coach O was was telling me, like, he read the article and he and he's and he really enjoyed that. And he liked to see, you know, all of these guys want to get back and connected with the program, wanting to do that. Because, you know, when you when you don't when you can't out produce the best teams with having the biggest budget, you know, you got to be able to leverage what you have. And San Diego state has a tradition of baseball players who go on to play professionally, who've had great success at, at individual success, um, especially at the college level. And that, that holds a lot of sway, you know, that holds a lot of sway with, with um, I think young guys and just their development and being able to, you know, tell people like you can, come to San Diego state and you can be, you know, a top pick. Um, they've done that multiple, multiple times. If Cardenas does it again, that'll be another one. You know, you, you, you can improve, you can do all of those things. And so I think connecting them with all of the alumni, um, you know, with the Bud Blacks of the world and all the people who are connected to it, um, I think can only help them and finding a great way to like organically, bring that about, you know, whether it was through the research projects that he was talking about or finding yeah. ways to connect the the players to um, the former players, I, I think it's just, I think it's genius and I think you just have to do it. Um, so I thought it was great. I like, you know, Stevens, he mentioned Steven Strasburg had been around the, the program over the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously it's in the middle of an MLB season. That was interesting. But- but with Strasburg's, you know, injury and, you know, we haven't really seen him pitch for about since they won the World Series, right, yeah. three years ago. Um, we don't know where his career is headed, whether it's going to, you know, not whether he's, you know, going to have to hang it up in terms of because of medical reasons. So he could be another resource for the program to to have in the going forward, whether it's in a coaching capacity or an advisor or whatever, uh, who wouldn't want to, you know, what pitcher wouldn't want to take 
you know, advice and lessons from, you know, Steven Sergeant Strasburg, right? So I think that was kind of, that was really cool when I heard that, even though in, in a way it's a negative thing because he's not pitching because he's injured. Right. Uh, it, that's kind of a, a, a side benefit, I guess, from that is getting, having that uh, wisdom and knowledge, you know, for the players. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that Strasburg, um, and the relationship that he had with Tony Gwynn, I think that's another great way to just keep that connected with it. Um, I would, I'm excited about the possibility of the USD game, as you already mentioned. Um, but I'm also excited to see and it again. This is something that I just, it, it, I had thought of. So if I've thought of it, um, smart people like coach Cole, like obviously thought about it 10 times before. Um, but it's always seemed weird to me, the lack of Padre presence at the Tony Gwynn classic that just, it just seems to be such a slam dunk of, of some way of, you know, um, we're going to have coach Cole throw out the opening pitch of the Padre game. The Aztecs are going to be playing the Tony Gwynn classic in honor of the Tony Gwynn classic being played, you know, you know, or whatever. I mean, whatever those things are, or, or, um, you know, asking the Padres in between innings to to show a couple highlights up on the thing and saying, "Hey, this is the, the Tony Gwynn Classics happening over there," or you know, um, do some little promotion where it's like, you know, all you can eat seats in 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 right field, and anybody who buys a ticket to this game will also get a ticket to whatever, what, you know, whatever. I mean, whatever they can come up with, but it just it just makes all the sense in the world. And so I'm glad that he's having those conversations, and he has all of the personal relationships with the Padres to be able to try to figure that out. And I don't know how creative the Aztecs can be um, in terms of, you know, what limitations they have because they are, you know, obviously a college campus and things of that nature. And you're asking people to come onto a college campus, but like, I, I mean, with the, with the storm, not that far away um, with the way that Petco park has, has turned into this. I mean, the baseball has not been very good or it's actually really like, Every third game, it's really entertaining, fun baseball. And then, you know, it's not so much. And yet it's packed and it's a party every single time that you go, that you go. Like, I just wonder if there's a way to, to try to duplicate that, you know, at Tony Gwynn Stadium. If, if there's a way to, you know, obviously in a smaller budget way, be able to, you know, engage the fans, get them, get, get the kids out of the dorms and over there because they're gonna, what? I don't know. I don't know what those things would be. Um, but I, I would be excited down the road to see if they could get some of that fan experience. You know, I know that they have like new video boards and they're, they're, they're rolling out some of those things to make the fan experience a little bit better. I would imagine his connections with the Padres should at least facilitate a little bit of those kind of conversations. Um, because no matter who you are, you know, and, and I, and I think that in in today's day and age to get somebody to to really to go out there and want to do something like that with all of the other things that they are that are out there to do um you know i think you need to make it a, a pretty fun environment and and figure out how to you know show people up on the new jumbotron and get them to sing songs and get them to do all of the stuff that people do so they're cheering and paying attention and it and it's you know something that they remember and want to come back to yeah, it's new. It's a new regime, and we'll see what impact it has on the baseball team when they get going. Um, obviously, early twenty twenty four when the season starts. But the season that's at hand right now is college football. Oh, buddy! Oh, buddy! Let's Finally, Let's um, go. San Diego State starts its season against Ohio on Saturday at four p.m. at Snapdragon. You know, we knew Ohio was a ten win team. We knew they had good players. You know, the more I dug into them I've, over the last few days, the, you know, writing my preview, the more impressed I am with so many of their players. Sure. Um, they are going to be, they are going to, they could possibly be outside of Oregon State, the best team San Diego State plays this year. You're going that far. So that, that, that you would go potentially UCLA oh, wild oh, card because they have so many new guys we haven't seen, especially on the offensive side. But but Ohio is a talented team at, on both sides of the ball. At a, almost every positional unit, they've got a playmaker. Uh, they're a good team. It's going to be a tough matchup for sure, especially for a San Diego State team team that has that breaking in so many new starters, 
back, you know, primary backups, things like that. And yeah, it's it, it's a game. Uh, I think if San Diego State wins, it'll be a big victory, a very positive victory for them considering the opponent. I think you're 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 right, and um, there's so many places to attack this. Um, let's start with the starting QB for Ohio. Yeah, half of me believes that that guy is not playing on Saturday. Mm. We got the two deep from San Diego State, and here's the offensive line. It's all this time. Finally, here we go, and it reveals nothing. Um, and and this is the thing. I'm trying to wrap my mind around. So I said half. I said half, half of me. Half of me feels like this is gamesmanship by Ohio. And without knowing their their coaching staff, I don't know if they do this, you know? So I, I, I don't have that experience, but I'm trying to wrap my mind around what benefit do they get by announcing early that he's their guy and he's going to be playing? The only thing I can think of is confidence for their team. They want them to play like, we're the best team. We need to play with confidence. We're it. We're going to be really good. We're the should be the MAC champions. We would have been last year, but then I'm wondering myself with such a veteran team, do they lack confidence? I can't imagine that that would be the case. Yeah, um, and so I'm just trying to figure out like why would you announce it? And um, the only I I can also say to I can also come up to the idea of saying because he's not playing and they want San Diego State to spend as much time as possible prepping for him as opposed to um, their other quarterback, um, C.J. Harris. Thank you. Um, who is a better athlete and a bit more runner, I should say, um, and and stuff like that. So I said half of me, I'm just, I'm still really, really interested to see if he actually plays. Um, because again, I, I just don't see what the benefit is to Ohio to announce it early. Well, here's... Monday morning, Pete Thamel from ESPN tweeted that sources told him that Curtis Rourke it will be will be starting. Right. And then at their at the coaches press conference, so a, a reporter actually asked him about that report. He did he and said, he said practice? And he said we well we're getting we're about to practice and we'll know after yeah. practice. And then after yeah. practice is when they tweeted out QB one and with a picture of Curtis Rourke. I assume it was a picture. Of, yeah, it was for Curtis Rourke. So, A, what you're saying could be completely true, that they are gamesmanship. Or B, they were not planning on doing that, but since Pete Thamel already kind of reported it, they are like, we well, might as well just announce it. But, 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 I mean, what we learned in conference realignment, uh, I don't think Pete Thamel is is given, and I've met him, so I, I you know, Pete is is... You know, I don't know what, um, like, it seems like every time he tweets somebody, it's because somebody is trying to make a point outside of just Pete Thamel doing his job. Mm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, why? What? Again, it's the same kind of thing. Like, why do you leak that? Especially when you're going to play, you're going, I don't know. I just, I just find it interesting. It's just something that's in the back of my mind of just, like, like, I, I expected, I think going into the week, I expected him to play and I expected him to like us to know that at like three (laughs) o'clock, you know what I mean? Or something like that. And so it was just, it surprised me because, you know, if he, let's say he does play, you want San Diego state to spend as much time on the second quarterback to not get ready for him. You know what I mean? Or you don't want him to like, you know, because if you're if you're sitting there and you're and you're with um, their backup quarterback, you want that guy to become a pocket passer. You want him to kind of stay there and and pick you apart. Like that's your goal mm-hmm. with it. But with Rourke, you're going to want to blitz like crazy. I mean, that's a different game plan altogether. And so it's it's again, it just begs the question: like why why tip your hat and say, okay, Coach Maddox, bring it, bring the heat like crazy because you know. Um, well, I but, asked, but, but I don't. Know. I asked Brady Hoke on at Monday's press conference how different the game plans for the two quarterbacks are because of their playing style, and would that affect who's you know what or right. are they too similar? And he said, I think the 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 what he said was C.J. Harris is more athletic; he can run better. 
Right. Uh, Rourke is probably the better passer, but he can also run. And Harris is also a decent passer. Right. In 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 a way, he almost made it seem like the game plan is not going to be very different. Who's quarterback? Um, obviously, you have you have, yeah. Obviously, yeah. you still have to prepare a couple things differently depending on who's taking the snaps. But it sounded like at least you know going back to the gamesmanship right. uh, that he didn't necessarily uh, say that you know their game plan is going to be different with whoever is the quarterback. Now that uh, said, that said. Yeah. That said, I think Rourke, Rourke has a great opportunity in front of him with San Diego State. You look at what he's done, and he plays great against MAC opponents and lesser athletic defenses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he had a really hard time against Penn State, Iowa State last year. And I think San Diego State offers him an opportunity to show that he can be good against um, guys who are at least going to have been the, you know, the fringe of the NFL, right? Which it seems like all of San Diego state is on the fringe of the NFL right now. And so I think that it's a, it's an opportunity for him, but some of the questions that I would have is so much of their running game is predicated on read options and just using one vendor to read the quarterback as kind of a blocker. And I wonder how much that's going to be there with his knee. Um, you know, if, if a, you, you want to open him up to that possibility and B, you know, like how much an end who's unblocked or linebacker who's unblocked is going to be like, okay, I'm going to sit here and not go after the quarterback who has, who's only nine, who's less than nine months removed from, um, from that. But, um, he makes all the throws. Uh, there's a couple throws against um, Penn State that you're just like, oh, that's a professional throw. Like you just you just don't usually see um, at the collegiate level throws that you know. Um, the next time you know Jalen Maiden makes those throws, it'll be the first time I've seen him make those throws. Um, and and so I I think it, it, that is a huge wild card in it. But to your point um, that you said at the beginning, he's not alone. Um, they got a big good receiver who's a transfer from Ohio State. Um, who's also, I believe, their punt returner. And yeah. th- they have a back who um, was the MAC freshman of the year and the first time that an Ohio guy had been the freshman of the year in in a number of, of, of seasons for them. Um, and, 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 you know, I learned from your preview about, you know, they have another guy, another back who was hurt, who's coming back this year and is going to be able to share the load. You know, their offensive line is pretty much all back. They have a 6-7 um, tight end. Who can you know give them some um, some multiplicity in their in their attack and what they do? You know, um, um, they they don't huddle, they don't huddle, mm-hmm. but they but they use the play clock, and so they're they're sitting there. They allow Rourke to make reads. They allow you know, and 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 so I think offensively, you know, I, I think they present a ton of challenges for San Diego State, um, especially because I don't think you can count on them to make a mistake, you know, going back to your point about UCLA, you know, um, you might feel fortunate that you get UCLA the third week because they're, they're going to, they're going to get experience and they're going to be better later on. But if there's a team that should be able to show up in the Snapdragon stadium and perform at a high level, it's Ohio provided. play. Yeah. I think the most concerning thing, if you're from a San Diego state perspective, is the size of the offensive line and the and the experience and the chemistry versus a very inexperienced defensive line. Right. A smaller defensive line. Like Garrett Fountain is 265. You know, um Dom Oliver is 260. Um, you know, Tupu is I think 280, maybe 290. I mean, these guys are giving up 30, 40, 50 pounds to some of these linemen. And that's not something new for San Diego State. But when you've got Cam Thomas and Keyshawn Banks and Jonah Tavai, who are playmakers, you know, you make up for that and their experience. But these guys aren't necessarily experienced and don't have that playmaking ability. So that's a big concern is if they're going to get pushed around on the line of scrimmage, the linebackers are going to have to make a lot of plays. And then, you know, sometimes you have over pursuits 
And that's when you get beat on a misdirection or, or an option pass. And that's why I put, you know, Zyrus, I think, uh, as a middle linebacker, could be uh, kind of the, a key player in this key matchup and and what he does um, against the run, against the play actions, against the options, because uh, it's the defensive line might have trouble getting in the backfield and making plays behind the line of scrimmage. Um, the secondary, obviously, you mentioned Sam Wigless, the Ohio State transfer. Jacoby Jones is also another receiver that, like, he had a lot less catches than Wigless last year, but his yards per catch were much higher. He was the big, he made a, a lot of big plays. He's a taller guy. So he's another guy that, the you know, whether it's Des Malone or Chris Johnson covering him, you know, they're, he's going to be a, a big target that, this, that Rourke is going to look for. A lot of a lot of talent across all those uh, skill positions for uh, Ohio. You know, yeah, we'll I, mean, see. I think one of the things one of the things that I that I that I saw to to sticking with the offense, and we're going to jump to the defense. Um, but against Penn State, the the, the linebackers, um, the linebackers had enough speed to be able to get through those blocks. So those guys are big. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how athletic they are. And I don't know if, if those guys that you mentioned are moving and stunting and how all that works. Um, but there was a, a linebacker in Penn State who just, they couldn't block them. And there's been a lot of linebackers that have been at Penn State that people can't block. So, you know, um, but just watching it, you're like, they kind of matched up everywhere else, but they just could not contain this one linebacker. And, you know, it, it, again, I don't know smoke and mirrors and stuff, but Vicajo was listed as the starter next to Zyrus Fuseo. And, and I thought as far as, you know, getting an attacking downhill, but also physical linebacker like that. And he, he very much has that profile that, um, yeah. that, that linebacker from Penn State had. So I, I didn't know if it's going to be, I'll be interesting to see if, if the linebackers can, do exactly what what Penn State was able to do and use kind of their superior athleticism to be able to you know hit those gaps and and all of that um you know but it's interesting it's a lot of discipline man right i mean they 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 do short passes they you know have a have a a veteran qb who can kind of see what could what should be open pre snap um and then when they get you thinking about the short stuff then they're going to they're going to take shots so pretty formidable yeah, you know, you mentioned the, the San Diego State's too deep. You know, you were, there are a lot of surprises. You wrote a great article about all of those surprises. Um, a lot of people on social media were, you know, asking a lot of questions about where so-and-so is and where so-and-so is at. Is at. And I get that, you know. I have those mm-hmm. questions. Well, why didn't Why didn't you write the article about the two D? Why, why don't you go ahead and tell them what you told me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not after last year falling <laughs> for it week after week. Yeah, and asking those same questions, and I I, I basically realized that you know the, those Monday morning two deeps five game five days before a game it means nothing. Yeah. And I was like, that'll motivate me to write an article. Thanks, Andre. <laughs> yeah, I, I said, I think it's worthless. I yeah. might have used yeah. the word worthless. Pretty cool. um, <laughs> and then um, and then Brady said on Monday, like all these because there was a lot of oars, right? Um, and he was like, oh, you know, those decisions are going to be made by Wednesday, Wednesday after by. So like a lot of those are going to change. I mean, last year, Zyrus was not even listed on the two deep heading into the um, Hawaii game. Right. And game starts and he's a starting middle linebacker. Yep. So it's like, A, I think there's gamesmanship. B, a lot changes. If that depth chart come, came out on Friday, the day before a game, I would, I would think it would be, it would have more meaning after a week of practice and preparation. But those, it comes out on Monday. I, I don't know. I think there were a lot of surprises. There were a lot of oars. Yeah. You would rather not see those oars at this point after fall camp, but I, I don't I, I don't make too much about who's not there, who's listed where. Um, yeah, I, I think. I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, uh, if you go with like, again, years past, how much it like never changes from week to week. 
Yeah. You know, you rarely, you rarely see a lot of changes on there. Um, but you no, know, I wrote, I wrote the article because, you know, I, I, I wanted to point out everything that you, that you just said. And then just to talk about, you know, the opportunity to talk about Jay Root. I think it's fabulous that the camp that he's had, did you see the picture that Don put up yeah. with him? That was this great shot. I mean, talk about the, the perfect timing for that shot. Um, but I, you know, being able to talk about Jay Rudolph, um, I thought, you know, he he's done really, really well. It's great. It was great to see him how fast he was, the not looking limited at all, uh, and and you know, and so those kind of things. But going to the other side of the ball, I think, you know, so I just for everyone to know, posted Andre's preview on the Ohio Bowl, and I do this from time to time, um, and it, it's just a sincere thing. I want to make sure that we're doing a good job and like actually capturing the the essence of a team because that's a hard thing. Obviously, we know state very very well. Um, Ohio, you know, you're you're going to make sure that you're that you're getting like the right stuff. And so I I posted on there basically saying, hey, could a few of you look at Andre's work and let us know? Did we get your team right? Because you know you know this team way better than than we did. And one of the, and everyone, but they all loved Andre's work um, and said that they, that he captured the Bobcats. But one of, I thought the best um, compliments that he got was one of the posters said, everybody talks about how bad their defense is, but you're one of the few who actually, and it was great because they directed towards me as if I had written the article. Thanks, Andre. And um, like every other article, like every other, I know I try not. I don't know. Like, I, I feel like I say very crystal clear, try not to take credit. Um, but <laughs> they, uh, they, they said that, you know, that article that you shared was, was, was one of the few that talked about the difference between the first half and the second half of the year. Um, and so they, they, they really, I think, appreciated that nugget because, you know, their defensive coordinator is now going into his second year and mm-hmm. how it, how they evolved and got better as the season went on. Um, but that said, if you watch the Arizona Bowl, um, which watching on mute, the commentary from Barstool yeah. is so bad. Um, but, you know, what? It, it, everything else production-wise, it's phenomenal. Um, but <laughs> they got bullied. Yeah by Wyoming. Wyoming was able to to run the football. They were able to control the line of scrimmage. They were able to, you know, they they came out passing the ball, which I think everyone was surprised, but they didn't have any trouble up front with either protecting the pass or being able to to establish the run. And I think if you're going into a place where you you, you would think that you if San Diego State is able to replicate that, um, you know, Aside from Idaho State last year, the only other team where San Diego State had its like most dominant run attack, it was Toledo. Yeah. They they won that game because of turnovers and they won that game because they were able to be the more physical team and and kind of, you know, we we wrote at that time that it was kind of a a benchmark to say, look, the Mountain West is a little bit better of a football because they're physically superior to what, you know, would eventually be because Rourke got injured, the champion of the MAC last year. And we all know the troubles that San Diego State has and was not the class of the Mountain West last year. I think if you're going into this game saying, where should San Diego State have an advantage? I think it is being able to run the football. And I think if they're, if they're able to, and they're successful in running football and, like after that Toledo game, I don't know that the running game did anything really the rest of the year. Um, I'd have to look back again. There may have been an odd game here or there or something, but by and large, you know, they 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 state couldn't run the ball, but to, against Toledo, they were able to. And I, I think that going into Saturday's game, I think that that's where you know they 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 really could have an advantage again going off of you know what Wyoming was able to do even after all of the defensive improvements that you mentioned. Ohio last year was 9 and 0 when they did not give up more than 5 yards per rushing rushing carry and 1 and 4 when they gave up more than 5. Mm. That tells you basically was that, was that was that one Wyoming? No, Wyoming's was less than 5. 
Okay. I didn't see which game that they won that was uh, higher than five, but but that that coincides potentially with like the turnaround on their defensive side halfway through the season. That some of those losses to Penn State, or Iowa State, were in the beginning of the year. You know, they've got Bonnie Watkins, um, who is their best edge rusher, best defensive lineman. They lost a couple big studs from last year's team, and so to see who's going to step in into those roles, I mean, they'll, they're kind of in the same position as San Diego State where they're trying to replace some guys. Now, San Diego State guys are, you know, two of them at least are in the NFL. Actually, I think all three of them might be in camps. Um, but, yeah, the, Ohio. How about Keyshawn Banks as a linebacker? Is that what, is, he's probably listed as an outside linebacker, right, in a 3-4? I think so. At least he was standing up. I, be, I believe so. He made that one great. He's yeah. on a big stop that you get one of game from him where you're just like, well, that was that was the week. Where did that where you know, can you do that more? Yeah. I'm not surprised by that honestly. I mean, Cam Thomas is an outside linebacker. Oh, completely. He has, it's 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 yeah. it's an interesting, you know, it's a, it's interesting, but it made a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Sorry. Yeah, and so they've got good linebackers, their top two returning players, defenders are leading tacklers, were linebackers. They've got good two good corners, a couple of sa- transfers that are safeties. But as I said, like if you look at how the defense played at the end of last season, you would think they were like one of the best defenses in the in the country. But yeah. you know that's a lot of that is situational, circumstantial of who you're playing and when you're playing them. Uh, it's a new season. They've got a, some new guys, um, so they're in a very similar boat to San Diego State. You know. When they played T- Toledo, the game was 17 to 7. Mm-hmm. Toledo won. When right. San Diego State played Toledo, it was 17 to 14. Right. And I asked Coach Hoke that, like, should we expect, you know, a, the winning team to score 17 again? And he's like, no, I, I, well, I hope we score more than 17. And I hope they don't. A very coach's answer. Sure. But if you're looking at how the teams are heading into Saturday, I would think that this could actually turn into in the high twenties or low thirties, potentially. See, and and again, I I, I know the 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 over under is forty nine. I think 49 that's and a, half, yeah, forty nine. Yeah, 49. yeah I, I think that's a good line because I cannot I can honestly make the argument the other way. Don't both of these teams want to limit possessions for the other team? Yeah, and so I mean, like you could conceivably see if if somebody goes on a long drive, you could conceivably see what five, six possessions in, in, in a half. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And so that, yeah. that's the part of it that I'm curious about. It's going to be, I think, it, to, to get to that level, I think it's going to have to be how efficient you are. And, you know, and, 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 and then the other piece of it, and the co- their coach spoke of that at their press conference, um, you know, he pointed to turnovers. And, and he talked about, you know, in, in a question, I believe, that was about San Diego State's offense. They were so good, Ohio. At, at creating turnovers last year. And you wonder how much of that is luck and how much of that is skill, assuming that it's a great combination of both. And the fact that San Diego State has been sloppy with the ball in both of the scrimmages, um, you know, I think that that's, that's a, something that could potentially be a big bonus for Ohio going into this game that should, you know, NASA fans should be paying attention to because if they are as close as everything's making it out to be, the turnover here or there, man, could make all the difference. Yeah, then, they were great. They were great forcing turnovers and not turning the ball over, which is why their ratio was, I think, 11th in the country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, Rourke had four four picks? Yeah, in, in mean, 11 that, games. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, you know, especially when and Jalen Maiden had five in his last two games. I mean, that's, it's, you know, and obviously – I think that we've said this over and over again. It was the only statistic and area in which Maiden looked like a safety. Yeah. Like ev- ev- everywhere else, he looked just fine. He looked like he'd been playing the position the whole time, but he but he just turned over the ball um, a whole bunch as if he hadn't been playing the position. Uh, so I think there's hope that that he cannot do that and he can you know find other ways to be able to do it. Um, but I think being fair about the game, I think that's a huge thing for for. Um, for Ohio and a, and a potential big advantage if, if you're looking to come on the road and um, and be able to, to pull off an upset. 
I don't know if you if you remember, but did you did you hear about the their head coach talking about um, San Diego State and they're lo- losing a bunch of linebackers from the year before? Um, I, I mean, I think he talked about losing a bunch of players. I don't know. Yeah, if, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so he said he said in there, and you can go back and look at it, he said he said, but from what I'm from what we're reading, it sounds like they've replaced them really well. I did. I did see that. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm like, oh well, thank you, Coach, for being a loyal reader of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's his staffers who read it and summarized it for for the coach. Well, no, yeah. he's thorough. He's thorough. He's a big fan of yours, Andre. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then what, tell me about the special teams, man, because I think I think if if you're again trying to be fair and with it. I think that on paper looks like a pretty big advantage for state. Their punt returner, Sam Wigless, uh, you know, I returned, I think he had less than three yards per carry, mm-hmm. three yards per return. Um, they had their, uh, their kick returner actually was decent. He, it was about 24 uh, yards per return, one touchdown. I think it was a 98 yarder, mm-hmm. but they lost their, you know, I think all conference kicker. He transferred to Wisconsin so they've got a new guy in and they've got a new punter in as well. So I, at this point, it looks like a big advantage for San Diego State because of the more of the certainties with Jack Browning. But, you know, we don't know. These guys that they brought in could end up being as good or better than what they had last year, right? In the kicker and the punter. So we'll see. I mean, obviously, returning, uh, replacing Jordan Bird is a is an, a wild card for San Diego State, but with Keenan Kristen and, uh, and Des Malone and, and Makai Shaw, you know, you, you think you can do a decent job there. So I think they've got the advantage. Obviously, Doug Deacon is never afraid to pull out a fake, uh, either a field goal or or a punt. Um, I think I heard Coach Hoke say today that they had three successful fake punts last year. Um so this could be a game to, to if he could if Coach Deke could find something on tape that he thinks he they can exploit, then um, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see another fake uh, come out in this game. Yeah, and I you know I just keeping in in keeping the the conversation going. Um, it seemed like that the they, their punter is a transfer from Vanderbilt, who mm-hmm. has graduated from there. So, um, sir. If you could give me a job, punter who graduates from Vanderbilt, um, I may need one one day. Um, but aside from that, he didn't seem like he punted very much at Vanderbilt. Um, so yeah. I think this is going to be his most extensive action. Um, I think as their field goal kickers, um, I, I I think they might both be freshmen, true freshmen. Yeah. Um, and and I'd have to go and double check that, but I think that's the case. At least the guy who won the job for sure. Um, it kicking in his first collegiate game, you know, uh, and then when I think the thing that could separate them is uh, barring something that is abnormal, you would expect Browning to be able to put the ball in the end zone on kickoffs, whereas um, there was a lot of short kicks. And so I'll be really interested. It'll be interesting to see, you know, um, how they approach how they approach that. You know, do do they kick it to Max Garrison? Do they try to do those little pooch things down to the tight ends? Um, yeah. Do they kick it deep and 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 try to um, get Kristen, um, you know, Keenan Kristen, uh, the the you know, an actual kick? Because um, I, I just think they're going to have more opportunities to to be able to to return those. So um, again, on paper, you never know how it actually is going to play out. Uh, so what are we at? Are you at prediction times? I think I saw you yeah. promise. Yeah, uh, one thing too, Makai Shaw being a holder was one of those surprises. Oh, there you go. Um, but I think part of that may be because of dress count. Because if you want, if Zachariah Ramirez is the holder and you already have Placencia that's the backup field goal kicker, then you're dressing three kickers. That takes away maybe one spot, potentially. Oh, jeez. I, I have no idea. I I I honestly thought. Um, remember when uh, Jack Browning scored a touchdown against Hawaii mm-hmm. as the holder? Yeah. I thought I thought it would give them more flexibility to do some of those fakes and some of those things because, you know, 
I, I think with Shaw. Did, with Shaw. Because I think yeah. I think you know from the from the holder kicker, um, I, I would say San Diego State with those two would have maybe like the two most athletic, the most athletic combo, you know, in the yeah. country. We know we know you know what an athlete Browning is. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's that's the way I saw it. Is instead of wanting to dress three kickers and only having Ramirez just be the holder, that you're using someone that's already dressed because of a different position of the holder, but. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, prediction. This is a tough one. Um, I've 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 landed on San Diego State twenty three, Ohio twenty one. Oh, a two point game. So, so so San Diego State is going to a Jack Browning field goal to win the game. Oh my goodness, that would be that would be a great way to be able to to have a great first game oh man i don't, I don't know man that, that if everyone's hearts in san diego can take it um i i actually think that uh san diego state is going to be able to run the football and i think when san diego state runs the football they're a good football team um so i think they're going to get a little bit of distance between them and um it will be a close but not really ever in doubt game that san diego state ends up winning um, I will say though that I think finding the um, momentum early, I think, is really, really important, um, especially in, the, in an opening game. You know, against Arizona last year, they just they did they couldn't find any momentum early. They got down quick, and then it was just sort of sailing that to to the end. Um, and so, being able to to find you know success early, I think, is going to be really important. Um, as far as a score is concerned, I'm going to go with, let's go with 16 for Ohio and 27 for San Diego State. Yeah. Yeah. 27, 16. And, and, you know, it, it'll give Aztec fans a little bit of hope as they uh, start thinking about a two and O against Idaho State and then going on from there. Aztec fans sometimes. Would rather not hear a lot of positivity and a lot of hope, but we'll see. That's true. I know. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's such it's such a no win thing because you know if, if you pick them, then you're a homer, and then you know all these kinds of things. But yeah, there it is. All right, guys. Hopefully, you guys are have your tickets for Saturday, Snapdragon Stadium. Uh, a lot of great tailgates uh, I've seen pop up and planned for the parking lot pregame. So make sure if you're going to get there early to find your favorite tailgates. And game kicks off at 4 p.m. and we'll see uh, how, how it goes. Um, Before that game, if you're jonesing for it, uh, men's soccer, they hmm. kick off their opener at Denver. And if you go onto the Go Aztecs website tomorrow, or the day that the, I should say, I'm sorry, the day this is coming out, where this is Wednesday night. So the day that this is coming out on Thursday morning, that they're going to be playing uh, Denver. Uh, and, you know, they, they have a really exciting season coming up. But on Go Aztecs, um, they uh, that should, it should be have a have a stream to be able to watch it. So as you're, you know, watching um, Florida and Utah start the is that next week? I'm trying to think. I think it's yeah, next week. that's next week. I would saw a commercial. So anyway, no. So no, there's no competition then. Go ahead and 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 see the men's soccer open up on the road against um against Denver, who has a very very good soccer program. What is, is it? Denver College. Yeah, at, de- yeah. Denver University. I don't know. But yeah, but they but but they can play. Like they're they're a they're a good soccer soccer program. Interesting. Hmm. Mm-hmm. But like I said, I I went on there and they already have like the video. And you know a link that's already like there to be able to watch it. So I think you know, be able to have the Aztecs, and then I think they're going to be back home for their uh, home opener on Monday up on the sports deck. So I think it should be pretty exciting. It's uh, Bakersfield. I think they're playing on on Monday. So you know, a lot and of, I lot think of they've happen. got. I think one, a women's and a men's game at Snapdragon sometime in October. Mm-hmm. That should be cool. Yeah, so there, there's 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 a lot going on there, and you know, trying to keep our you know volleyball. They they had their exhibition on Tuesday. Um, photographer down there, you know, taking some shots there. Women's soccer, so it's it's going, man. 
it's going. And, and so I think for people who don't like evil baseball teams in Los Angeles, uh. yeah. Um, you know, might, might, might be time to, 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 you know, let the, let the Padres languish in, uh, in without, without as much fanfare and, and see what's going on in the Mesa. Cause I think there's, there's a lot going on, but obviously chief among them is what happened Saturday. And, you know, I think San Diego state has a great opportunity to, to, to get some of those, you know, fair weather, San Diego fans fed up diehard fans who are just like looking for a reason to be really excited about this team. And I think that, 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 that potential can be there for them with, with a win on Saturday. Absolutely. Thanks guys for listening. Uh, thank you as always for uh, liking, subscribing, sharing um, on all your favorite platforms. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you guys out there at Stat Dragon on Saturday and we'll talk to you guys next time. Listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison.